Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I think we can do a little better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure to welcome you all here to the Carlos Museum. I want to start off by extending my thank you to Dr. Suba Xavier for envisioning this series. The Global Africa series is a new lecture series that we're launching and it is in essence designed to bring together more interdisciplinary scholars of the African continent and beyond. And I can think of no better than Dr. Barbaro Martinez Ruiz to inaugurate this lecture series for us. I have the honor of introducing him and it is my esteemed pleasure to welcome Dr. Martinez Ruiz, who currently serves as the Tanner Opperman Chair of African Art History in honor of Roy Sieber at Indiana University Bloomington. Dr. Martinez Ruiz earned his BA from the University of Havana, Cuba in 1994 and his PhD from Yale University in 2004. He is an art historian with expertise in African and Caribbean artistic, visual, and religious practices whose work challenges traditional disciplinary boundaries and examines the varied understandings of art and visual culture. As a religion scholar and a self-proclaimed sacred art scholar myself, I can tell you that his research has proven foundational in the fields of religious studies of African and African diaspora sacred arts. Following professorships at Havana's High Institute of Art, the Rhode Island School of Design and Stanford University, Dr. Martinez Ruiz joined the University of Cape Town, where he served as the head of the art history and discourse of art department. He was the 2017-2018 recipient of the Leverhulme Visiting uh, Professorship hosted by Oxford School of Interdisciplinary Area Studies and a senior fellow at St. Anthony's College and Trinity College. He continues to hold a position as research affiliate at Oxford University. Dr. Martinez Ruiz's published books include Congo Graphic Writing and Other Narratives of the Sign and El Colegio de Mexico, which is the Spanish translation, uh, Fezial Abdullah on the Art of Dislocation and Art and Emancipation in Jamaica, Isaac Mendez Belisario and His Worlds, which received the Alfred H. Barr Award from the College Art Association, the largest association for the study of art history in the United States. He is currently working to complete a new book project entitled Unwrapping the Universe, Art and Cosmology Among the Bakongo. I agree. Mm. Which takes the Congo concept of the universe as a packet or bundle and aims to unwrap the conceptual layers of specific works of art to gain a better understanding of their cosmological complexities and interrelated meanings and to describe the conceptual and functional associations of these objects within their cultural context. In addition to his research and teaching, Dr. Martinez Ruiz is an active curator whose exhibitions have explored issues of visual communication, dislocation, and hybridity in the work of contemporary artists across the African diaspora. He also serves as an editor for the Cuban Studies Magazine and Harvard's Transition Magazine, and was a researcher for the Pacific Standard Time AL at the Getty Foundation and the Museum of Latin American Art, Los Angeles, California from 2014 to 2016. Here, I always like to end my introductions with a little bit of a personal note. And here I have to share that when I transferred to Stanford University as an undergraduate student, I came to work with Dr. Martinez Ruiz. He was a groundbreaking art historian, religion scholar, and it was the first time as a student of art history that I had an opportunity to see a black scholar, a Caribbean scholar, not only of Caribbean art history, but of African art history. It was nothing short of inspiring. I was riveted in his lectures. I took copious notes. I had the opportunity to take independent studies classes and I just, just couldn't get enough. He is ever generous in his mentorship, incredibly filled with foresight and hindsight regarding the trends in the field. And it is my deep pleasure to welcome you here to Emory University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Martinez Ruiz. Hello. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Is I I've, since I, I've been here, I feel like in somehow I've myself been melted into the amount of kindness and um, friendliness that I'm not used to in general. Um, and 
I, I just wanted to say that as a kind of um, way to move forward in this uh, exchange today. I also would like to dedicate the lecture today to uh, um, Suba, Jacqueline, and Kira as kind of token of gratitude for, you know, the invitations and making everything happen in the way it's supposed to happen. And, um, and also, I extend uh, um, greetings to the African Studies, African Descent Department of African American um, Studies, uh, uh, our history departments, and the museums. Um, and also, in general, for being such an incredible place for learning and, and beings that I think it's just uh, very refreshing, at least for me. Um, since I, I've been in a lot of activities you know, around and moving around, and I think it's the, enough for me to see this is a very special place. And um, do not take it for granted when you have it. Um, but the, what I try to what I try to cover today is the one of the biggest assumptions about the study of Africa. It's uh, had to do with uh, there are two big assumptions. One is the uh, African lack of history. That is uh, the big lights that being being promoted over um, 150 years from different disciplines, from archaeology, anthropology, and so forth, and including our history. And the second one is the, the African lack of writing. And I think if so you don't have a writing, of course, you cannot have, you don't have agency into writing into your own history. And what I try to do today is just to kind of pick one specific civilization from Africa and, and how they're understanding and taking into what that means to write in a, in a very specific way and how this writing um, impact the sense, the inheritance of these traditions in the other side of the Atlantic. In, in the Americas and in places like Cuba, um, Haiti, and Brazil. Um, and the title is also had to do with that. It's something that it's like a candy you can, even you don't want it to eat it, it's on how you put it in your mouth. You know, it's just a, um, but the the area I wanted to cover today is the Northern Congo, Angola and Southern um, Congo. What it used to be the former Congo Kingdom go back to around 1265, you know, give it and take, um, according to historical record. Um, and I'm kind of my study is focused since 1999. It's a kind of historical Congo art, you know, the, the Congo diasporic art, you kind know, of go back more than 20 or 30 years before that. Um, and I kind of all my research is to kind of around this particular area that I pretty much do by tracking. So I, most of the places I would present it to, to do today, they, I walk to those places, you know, long distance, 50 miles, 20 miles. Um, and I still do it today. I'm planning to do it in the summer again. Um, but this, the, what you see here in, uh, in the screen on the left is just kind of like a to see the incredible diversity of languages and people that an assumption, a generalization that doesn't really work when we try to make like a general concept that we think is applicable to all of the related culture in that area. Um, and in a way you can see the diversity is kind of higher than, you know, the entire continent of Europe, which you kind of pick as a, as an example of comparison. Um, but the, what I wanted to start today is with a uh, acknowledgement of uh, something very important for every culture in the world. If every culture in the world have a cosmogram, every religion in the world they have a cosmogram, a design, a complex design that encapsulate the principle and the base of that culture. You can explain how this culture works by using this cosmogram. That is pretty much what that means, the basic of the application of a cosmogram. And also go back into this theory of uh, empty hands, empty headed, that there's something that's being used to describe the African experience through the slight trade. The, the fact that we, in somehow, 
we can only write the history of African people through material object. That is the kind of fascination we have. We can, we, we need to have something tangible that allow us to explain the history of Africa. When we don't have it, we arrive to the simple conclusion, African people do not have history. We don't think that history could be uh, record and achieve in the memory of the people. It's, it's the memory, the brain is exactly the recording machine that allow to use something like a cosmogram. Um, but a cosmogram, as I say, you know, can be used in three different, I've just put in multiple applications, but I think one would be um, a history of migration, something that fascinated to me, something that is an interest uh, in my personal, personal work today. Um, the cosmogram also tells the story of migrating to places to places and accounts of time and changes to time. Um, and also, a cosmogram allows you to give you the basic, you know, nature of how this culture functions and works, and also allow to express the Congo people how they view the world, the place in the world, you know, their centrality in relation to the world. Um, at that point, you know, the cosmogram have a you know, a significant more richer um, use that we sometimes think as a, a symbol of a culture and the way we want it to simplify. Um, but the historical foundation go back into uh, just an example you can see here on the screen. And this is just a research being conducted since um, between 1965 to 1975 by a Portuguese um, archaeologist being published around 1976 after the uh, independence of uh, Angola. And you can see uh, several Rupestrian or rock painting sites that go back, even the oldest, I just want to kind of play in a little bit with the assumption we have about cultural heritage and cultural influence. And the oldest, Kaningiri on the right, is 7,840 years ago. And in a way, we're talking about um, a significant amount of time in which the cosmogram being is recorded in time and place in history. Before, because assumption the cosmogram being some, something being um, copied from external uh, cultural influence. But here, can I put you in the context that the cosmogram already been in this kind of particular region for you know eight thousand? I think there is no. There are maybe a few places in the world that can say that uh, a, a particular graphic expression that being over 10,000 years in a place in use. And kind of using here archaeology to give a particular evidence of, you know, the continuity of a, and, um, and it's just an example of uh, the actual designs in multiple variations that have been, you know, um, uh, recorded in Rupesian's uh, sites all over these regions. Um, and this is the last one um, that is uh, my personal research. When I sent it to the lab, the, the evidence for carbon-14 came back around 1270. This is pretty much uh, the Portuguese arrived to the Congo Kingdom in 1481. This is, you know, a long period of time before the Portuguese arrival introducing, um, you know, Christianity as a main religion in the kingdom in 14, like 10 years later. Um, but this is an actual example that gives you more close, you know, observations and relationship with the actual cosmogram today, what they call the Dikenga, is the actual name. And now you can see is a perfect cross with the arms of the cross, they, they are equal. Um, um, the notifications of the codification of the cardinal points that matter, the four cardinal point matters, and the positions of the um, um, north, south, east, and west, and the divisions of the circle um, in the vertical axis and the horizontal axis are also critical in understanding the cosmogram. That almost the equivalent you will have is the, the Greek cross. This will be the, the in terms of the designs, the proximity in terms of the design. Um, and what you see on the left is an example from the actual site um, that go back into the 13th century. But the, the cosmogram, you know, can be used to explain basic, you know, principle in the Congo culture. It's, it's about the world in which human live. It's also it's a statements about the understanding and realization of the 
environment in which humans, you know, reside, and that will be kind of represented by the upper triangle. And also that environment also is defined by three different kind of uh, uh, experiences, the physical realization that you are alive, you are a human being, um, the spiritual uh, complexity, and, uh, um, and the mental that had to do with the problem that emerge in society. Um, the second part of the, um, you know, reversed um, the triangle, it represents the world of ancestor, the untangible, invisible realm. And I'm um, turning to this uh, combinations of the two triangle into a diamond shape that is the actual representation of the decaying cosmogram in itself. Um, and um, and the actual divisions of the uh, horizontal lines, that is, uh, the name is Kalunga, that is represent the ocean, is the boundaries that divide these two uh, realms. Um, but the Congo cosmogram have a little bit more explanation about our condition as a human. So what main us, you know, humans, that also the cosmogram gives you the possibility to explain our humanity in a kind of biological sense. And they, they believe the position number one, um, and so what kind of four stages in our human evolution, so human conditions that start from position number one, called Musoni, that is represented with the color yellow, and it has to do with the capacity of life. And you move into position number two, um, Kala is uh, black, that is the color of uh, life and vitality. And you move into position number three, that is uh, uh, Mukula, that is red, that it had to do the maturity and transitions. And position number four is white, that had to do with uh, passing over maturity and death. But in a way, it's the idea of a cosmogram, a stage, this idea of every human is a small sun that migrate through the span of a life. And our vitality get bigger from the moment we've been conceived to the moment we die. That is what the sun is kind of, in a kind of symbolic way, I kind of try to mimic the idea of our um, spiritual power get bigger when you kind of move along through your life and die in position or die or go on vacation in position number four. Um, and um, Kalunga has that line that divide um, the two realm. Mukula is the axis that allowed to connect these two realm. And this is the perfect cross that made the actual cosmogram. Um, and this is the cosmogram in the original context. Now you see the is color codified um, that go from yellow and ochre on the base, that would be the first position, black and and um, gray, um, red and orange and white on, on the left. And um and the meaning kind of associated with each of each of the each of a color. But the, the cosmogram as the axis of the world, as a crossroad, or, you know, represent the four seasons of the universe. There also some observations about not just our relationship and experience on planet Earth, also is observation of our life in relation to uh, the universe in a way. Um, the kind of astronomical implications of the use of the Kenga, if you, you know, think. And also, the idea of a world is a microcosm that can be studied in a small scale as the way we can understand ourselves as a humans. I think that is another implication of that. Um, but the uh, uh, Musoni is the the word for um, writings in Kikongo, and uh, and the notion of writings into the context of the Congo religion that uh, define as Makisinsi, what is unique and proper. Of a place this is what I mean, Makisinsi in in Congo, uh, uh, and they have this kind of key principle: the Congo cosmogony, the Congo moral philosophy, and the history who the founder of the culture, um, and it also can be kind of explained in this kind of each of the different principle has own ramifications. The the, the Congo cosmogony, they have this you know explanation about the spiritual, the physical, and the emotional, the Congo moral philosophy, have an understanding of a human body or embodiment, um, the tangible life and the invisible life. And, and the last one is the founders of the culture, you know, who created the, the culture back in time. Um, 
But when you think about the Kenga cosmogram in a visual art, this one is easy to explain in a kind of graphic form, but how it takes shape as an art form? That is like a $1 million question. You know, how it look like? If, if you if you are a Mukongo person and had to translate this idea into art, how it will look like this? And this is the, the one on the left, the ways the the Bakongo people represent the principle of the Kenga, the cosmogram. It's like a, a container, like a pot. And the pot is a metaphor of earth. Everything good and bad is inside, the poisons and the food. Everything that saves and kills you is inside the pot, including humans. And it's what is in the kind of big pot on the left. And I kind of repeat in a small pot with three stones that associated with a, a call, um, um, Makukwa Matatu, uh, Malembila in the Congo is an, a, a proverb that stays the three speaking stones that the Congo king used to cook and gather his people. And the idea of a fire as a unifier of the people is very important to three stones that may use for the cooking season under the tree called Nsanda. Um, and there's the idea of a repetition, but the repetition went from the one part to three, from the big spot, part, I'm sorry, to small part in the, on the top but added the free cooking stones on the base in African art called fractal, a repetition that when you repeat it again, you add an element that complex the original meaning that is very unique of African, African art. But the African Congo religious people, Congo um, descent in the African diaspora in Brazil didn't recreate this three-dimensional object we see it on the left. They decide to do to print. So they might kind of be dimensional expressions. And this is an example from Umbanda, uh, Punto Riscados uh, drawings they made every year. So now it's like a 20,000 Punto Riscados. And this is one of the tell the story of an African person walking into the forest and he encountered these three stones there speaking to each other that go back to the original proverb that are on the left, this kind of shape, in a kind of our form here to being used in a kind of graphic form to train and teach the people about not just the pro about the history and important important of family and the idea of a fire is the one that unifies the fire is associated with food and meeting together uh, it's very clever um, i know there's another example of the pot that you can see as the art form from kabasi on the left um, capuchin monk and this is a different type of pot being also depicted in popular arts, if you want to say popular arts in uh, in Cuba. But what I've been thinking for the Dikenga, when I went to, um, I went to Angola, I went to Angola in 1986. That was the first time I was in the army. I was uh, 18. Um, I didn't have time to look for this kind of thing. Um, and um, under 1999, I went back to do field work, and I was obsessed with finding the engraving on the wall. And I was everyone took me to a place of there is not engraving on the wall. I get so mad internally. And um, until someone took me to this cave, and the first thing he did when I arrived, he uh, did the kenga, depicted the kenga on the floor. It kind of changed my entire, I was looking, I was asking the wrong question of the wrong manifestation. And I kind of, that was the beginning of searching for the kenga, find it. And I kind of expanding the different manifestation of the kenga through in a historical context in, in the Congo culture and back into the African diaspora. Um, but the, when you think about the continuity in the African diaspora, this is the the oldest reference we have of a Dikenga in the African diaspora. In um, you can see here from the South Carolina, uh, from Palm Club Plantation. This is a very interesting story. Um, the owner of this plantation have a lot of problem, of trouble with water, and. He realized the slave in the plantation knew a lot about water. The knowledge of water was, you know, paramount. And he decided to enlist the slave from the plantation to help him out. This is in the record from, uh, uh, from the plantation. Um, when the, the owner kind of wrote a history of, you know, the economic, he went through a lot of economic droughts and couldn't produce and tried to sell the plantations. And I can narrate the story, the how African people 
save his uh, business in the end. On one, he um, relies the many of the African people used to storage fresh water in these containers. And they used to have the kenga engraved in the base of the pot and inside when the water used to resize as a science of like purifying and keep fresh the water. But not just that. The plantation couldn't have enough water for all of the crops. And the same slaves that used to they also produced the ricotta in condition of slavery designed a system of flake in the plantation and interconnected to each other that allow the plantation to have fresh water for agricultural activity throughout the whole year. But the funny thing is not about the lake in itself, is how they call that lake, lake Simbi. Simbi is one of the most important uh, concepts in Congo religion. It's, it had to do with the metaphysical and, and psychological manifestation of God in this world. It's more important than God. And the name also Simbi, Simbi Kiamasa, is the vitality of the fresh water. That was the name the slave gave it to the lake system they created for the plantation. 1753. In a way, you think about the applications of uh, the Kenga here in something like labor and agriculture in condition of slavery that didn't prevent the skills and imagination of African people to produce under those kind of conditions. This is just an example of a Dikenga in Cuba. Um, that could be a graphic represented on the left, it could be on the right, an organic material like necklaces. Um, but rock are our migrations that, that is a very important theme for me. And it doesn't have to do with the the story where we come from. I think everyone likes to, you know, have those kind of questions and uh, you know, like skip gauge show. It's about family history, try to trace your history back. And I know interest in those kind of things. Um, I'm more interested in, in why we migrate and how we migrate. What, what are the technology that empower us to migrate, including when we are um, I am, you know, an immigrant into this country. You know, I, need to, I need to create technology to allow me to live, not survive. I don't like the, I don't like the word survival. To, to live here in this new environment, to accept this environment as an extension who I am from my previous one. And I have a very complicated life. I just don't want to get into that. But the, the assumption that people made about migrations is that um, in the study in Central Africa, migration took place to, through uh, um, water course. You know, the, no, the original source, you know, suspect in this kind of assumption is the Congo River, is the people use the Congo River to migrate from north to south. But the river doesn't even run from north to south. That is one. Also, so big and strong, difficult to cross. It doesn't make sense. And as I'm doing research in, along the river, I couldn't, on the coastline, I couldn't find anything until someone explained to me that the Kenga is about understanding of environments and the forest as an ecosystem. You need to kind of rethink the actual how we migrate. So migrate is just all, this, all this problem about migrations that explains that people migrate using kind of spiral design. Because in the forest you cannot you cannot walk in a straight line, and I kind of started kind of finding a different way to explain. So you can see in most of the places and highlight here that I found pedestrian sites every ten miles, the distance between each other. There's places for settlements, um, and I kind of tried to kind of figure it out the way, um, not just the distance and how is the relationship between the actual people today, those those sites in time. Just keep it a sense of the places I visit. This is need to be updated, but uh, um, give it a sense of uh, maybe 10, 15 years that all the places I walk uh, in 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 that area. This is the kind of rainforest uh, places, um, quite far, difficult to to go um, on on top of you know malaria and all these other things that you can face. But also one of the things that is important that in um, as 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 a given from rock painting is the understanding of time. And the time is kind of is a concept that you will find in every culture and uh, in the world. And just as just one example of a site, this is one of the sites in a um, in Finland, Tuta, that has been found in a 
right on the border between Angola and Congo, a five mile from the border. Um, and it's a stone that's been covered with a wild uh, um, bean called thistle. Uh, you cannot touch it because it burns your skin. You cannot be in the shadow. It's, it's quite dangerous. And also those uh, uh, African ants that kind of already took over the whole thing. It was almost impossible. They are very vicious. And um, um, and I don't know if I have 24 hours, just giving a sense of the actual site. Um, but it's just one of the, the details from that side The you can see one of the feature of rock painting art in Central Africa, every science, every design is connected to a verbal account, to a, what we call prover. You cannot explain the rock art because the styles and, you know, mo most of the study of rock painting is doing a stylistic analysis of what you look at. Here, it's more important to understand the verbal connection between the actual design, what the design articulate, what is the counterpart as a you know a short story or proverb or a moral lesson. And it's the first thing you have to hear is a kind of notation of time. And you can see on the whole uh, on on the left, on the image on the left, and um and you can see like the progression from whole from the left to the right of the top to the bottom. You can see on the right the kind of projections of uh, all the different number that take to 61. Um, and each of them have a different um, um, kind of notations of different time. Um, and this is kind of Congo belief in the week have four days. So they're still using that particular on the same of sign today, uh, despite the being imposed a particular um, time structure that seven days on Saturday and Sunday, the but Congo people have the internal timeline that is only run for four days until today. And, and as you can see, is the the year is organized in seasons, and um, you can see on the on the second section, and um and the different you know the names of the day, and um, you can see pretty much match with uh, the calendar we use uh, today, but organized by season is why you have the notation on the left, the holes, the numbers, the the digits that have been um, notated on the stones as a kind of recording a particular season. They must, you know, was important to them for hunting or um, harvesting uh, fresh fruits in the forest and so forth. Um, but this is a, the record we have. Then there's a long history of a capuchin from the Jesuits to the capuchins um, notating and um, this approach to time by um, the Jesuit given a, by the Bakongo people over uh, 400 years. We just given a sense of the from the record, from the historical record on the screen right now from the 18th century. Um, and as you can see now the comparison between the two um, um, time systems, the one we use on the on the bottoms and the Bakongo on the on the top. There are writings that is kind of um, what I wanted to get today. Um, the first is the what I call iconic motif is one single designs that is isolated that doesn't work with other and that is what you can see is a double edge head arrow and you can see the prover and the explanation as a prover and you will have similar kind of independent like solomorphic representations and the proverbs and the meanings um and the second category of representation what i call iconic narrative when you have multiple design uh, complementing to each other interacting to each other um, and then you have it here. This is an example from um, um, a rock painting side. It had to do with uh, the rule of law. Is to kind of help the people to understand how the legal system work, and and what is punishable and what is not, and what is the function of the law in the system. And as you can see here, the system. You know, every narrative is just kind of connected to this word sansa. That means it had to do the. The meaning of the law is to educate people, not to punish them in, in the particular context of a Congo. And it's the explanation of this iconic narrative that have many different symbols, you know, imply that there is an event that had to be explained, there is an action that had to be punishment or warnings to someone um, violating the rules, and it's a description of what is acceptable, what is not, that is kind of explaining into the panel. Um, this is just example of similar um, type of iconic narrative. 
that you can see um, one depictions and multiple rovers attached to different part of the designs. And this one is a pregnant woman, and you can see multiple meanings attached to the designs. Um, but when you think about the, the it, this is not unique of a Congo people. You think about related culture like the Shokwe, uh, 200 miles away from the Bakongo people, they would have a similar kind of uh, approach to understand and uh, narrate story and record history through graphic elements. Um, and then you can see between the both from the Congo on the left and from the Shokwe on the right. Um, but the, the first writing, the first, how you write, that is, I think it's a $1 million question in this particular system. Um, what do you think is the first um, emphasis of verticality that we can kind of think about a historical example is this terracotta, funerary terracotta work. That you can see the actual verticality of the piece, this concentric circle, the, the, the resize and get smaller all the way to the Janus head on the top. And in a way, insist the actual way to read this object is by understanding there's a beginning on the base, in the bigger base, and move up to the top. But also, you can also understand inside the object, the, the specific meaning associated, you know, displayed into each of the layer that allow to understand, uh, contextualize each of the layer in a very specific way. Um, and um, you just uh, give it a sense of uh, not just the upside of the object is what is uh, uh, concealed to the viewer when you cannot have I have access. I only have access to that because I had to I had a request to do a, uh, x rays to those images because I knew um, from the real one. Uh, but this is just an example of the um, a kind of three dimensional writing that is make is is made in a, in season verticality, but it's made in an object, a funerary object. Um, um, just uh, I just give an example of how you can explain those. Uh, and I'm, the idea of a you know challenge verticality, uh, the idea of of uh, placing different meaning along the vertical lines, and uh, and 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 the end, the arrow became like the only one page in the book. Pretty much is what you have in the system that you can see here in the four different sections of the writing. But when you find, this is an example in the African diaspora. You don't have a three-dimensional object, but you have an incision verticality um, on the right. And the way you read it is from the bottom to the top. Um, um, those, uh, we'll just give an example of detail from this actual writing. I, I, I born in this writing uh, in my entire life, I know 5,000 of the symbol by memory. I can make it. I can explain pretty much everything besides, you know, Spanish or, I don't know, Russians or Dutch or other languages I do speak. Um, just a given sense of, a, you know, just a detail to understand what is here in the verticality that comes from this particular piece on the left. The second is the another kind of writing that is more like centripetal from the center out into the into the outlines of the shape of the object. And in this case, is this uh, lead part that designed by uh, by women when they have a concern with the husband. They design and when they have a problems, they conveyed all of the concern frustration to the husband through this art form. It's one of the most powerful art form. I know, but the important thing is the women guess what the husband would talk to her back. That is very important. Um, but this is a, uh, I saw 30,000 of this lead part as a tribute in archive in the storage. Um, but this is the one that after you know, looking for weeks and weeks, we kind of unveiled the, the process of this writing. And then you can see, um, they have like two important elements in the narrative. The one that dictate the statement from the wife and the statement from the husband and the final resolution of the problem, you know, the final statement. Um, you can see here that is kind of the final statement. Everything that is the 
striking is that the inside, so similar to the line that's going now, the line coming to the circle, are carried on as the building blocks providing the space inside. Um, and you can see here, husband, uh, what he's thinking, and the wife, and the uh, each of the symbol is also attached to the proverb that, you know, match with the rock painting Rupesian tradition is kind of a perfect match in this case here. And, um, and the final resolution go back into a series of popular depictions in which have an action similar to the way we use a verb to indicate an action, so specific when the Mary had to be um, dissolved. Just give a sense of a the final speech by the woman is not just a warning sign, she's just getting the divorce, pretty much, at the dinner time. Um, but when you think about these kind of writings, that this is an example from the African diaspora, when you have um, these writings that are a different name, stamp, and there's a reading in the writing to see how to put it. Uh, no, okay. I will stay here. Um, and then you will uh, read it in relation to each of them and create multiple relations. You can see there are more than 20 when you had to combine with the one in the center. And uh, one of the arguments being made before, this is from Paracelsus, that the, someone made an observation that the actual design on the left was a copy of Paracelsus because of similarity. Um, but the person who did that on the left couldn't read and write and never even read Paracelsian in his entire life. It just gave a um, this is an example of the writing, a similar kind of writing in the diaspora. This is from, from Veve from Haiti. Um, this is an example from Veve. I, I did that in Haiti um, a couple of years ago, maybe six years ago. A friend of mine asked me to do uh, these symbols of um, signs, Veve for Simbi. And I, I did. Um, this is from Brazil, called uh, Punto Riscado. Um, and this is just an example when I took my student to Brazil to learn uh, the writings. Um, and uh, also, you can see the activations of the meanings that take place through flame and fire. That's one of the important feature in all the writing, different from other writings. In a, um, and it's kind of the final resolutions of the writing. Um, but when you think about the building blocks, uh, the stamp, um, what really matter into when you go back into example, uh, this is just a, an example, a simple um, signs that is multiplied in a kind of fractal way. And every time you modify the symbol, you will see there is a change in the meaning. By using the triangle on the left as a basic design, I add one element and turn to a different meaning. You see, I uh, complicate in the design and the meaning change over time. This is one of the correct, you know, the, the traits of this writing system. But for to finish, I wanted to kind of show um, the new sites I encounter. I, I, I'm about to publish in the National Geographic um, does the, an article about the site. The one is from 1919, and the last. Uh, three there from last summer uh, because I need money to do the research and all that kind of thing. And uh, my endowment is not enough to do this kind of crazy thing. But it kind of opened a new opportunity for even people who wanted to study this kind of art and try to find this connection between Africa and the African diaspora that mattered to me. Um, and the first one is this, this uh, a tree. It's a tree that signified the encounter between a princess and the a king of the Bakongo, the Manikong, in which she challenged the authority of the king. This event took place around um, 1502, 1503. Uh, imagine a woman have the power to challenge her. She was so clever that he used very specific uh, tactic to um, not just to force the king to meet her in the forest in which the tree you know, represent that particular encounter. And also to make the, the king be afraid of her agency as a woman. And later, you know, um, she became one of the most important person in um, in the kingdom. Um, and this is uh, Doña uh, Isabel Dinguizi. And this is the actual tree is in the, uh, in the forest. You can see 
here in the one in the center is engraved uh, on the on the tree and have all of the different layers of symbols that had to be read it in layers from the top to the bottom and around the tree. I think that has kind of cinematic kind of quality because you only can understand the story by moving around the tree. A baobab that in that grow in the forest, a baobab do not grow in the forest. That is why the baobab is skinny. It's a tree that doesn't belong to the forest. Um, and they're just symbol from that side and all of the proverbs that is connected to that, um, all the representations that I found in that tree. This is the king that um, the, the, the princes have a particular order. They had to be transported in this traditional kipoyu, but also in, he need to have the rifle facing down as a signs of peace or no aggressions. It just was one of the kind of being depicted on the pro the each of them have a proverb that tell, you know, the account, the historical account. Um, just given a sense of uh, the representation of elephants, all of the different narrative from part one, all of the different uh, other designs that had to do with the uh, um, animals and body uh, depictions, the part two, and you can see here the different positions of the body, and then at the end here, the the other sites I have for you is called the Stadi di Mpungi. Um, this is the actual site. It's like a massive rock. They have over 22 caves. I've been in this place uh, the first time I've been in 1999. And I, no one showed me the cave. They only showed me last summer. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It took like 20 years to see the, the trust. Um, but this is the actual site. And um, uh, rock art, Rupesian art with paintings is made only less than 1% of the uh, rock art. Most of the rock art in the Congo, in Central Africa, there are engravings. Is is uh, that also this red pigment that tell you that there could be burial over 2,000 years. Um, that is the, uh, now everything is at Oxford I'm waiting for the lab result to, to you know, get a better sense of a uh, the history of the place and the complexity of the place. Um, the second one is this cave. Um, this is inside the cave. And the last one is is this one. It's a very remote place that I had to walk 45 miles from the road into the actual site. And it's made out of eleven stones. The largest, the largest of the stone is seventy-six meter long, um, in a field over five hundred, four hundred meter square. Um, everything being very under the the um, soils, and kind of start cleaning, photographing, and kind of going back next year and build kind of roof over and do the proper assessment. Um, this particular site have five thousand groupings. Each grouping have between seven to 15 elements. I'll just give an example of one. Thank you very much. Let's take one more opportunity to give thanks to Dr. Martinez Ruiz for sharing his work. For those of you who are aspiring writers, just know these types of things take a long time. So we're, we're fortunate in getting a sneak preview of the book that is to come. I wanted to just take an opportunity. The fact that I have the mic means I get to start um, and say, you know, one of the things that I so appreciate about the work that you've done and the work that you continue to do do is to highlight these really important historical and contemporary connections between Africa and the African diaspora. And I'll give two very brief examples, and then I'd love for us to open it up to questions from the audience. You mentioned the importance of Simbi and Basimbi, Bisimbi. The way that I will describe typically to my students the importance of Basimbi in the context of Congo Kingdom, um, historically and still today, is that it is the term to refer to spirits. 
So in the Yoruba context of Nigeria, when you speak about spirits, you use the term Orisha. When talking about, that's also the same term that you use in Cuba, in the Yoruba tradition of Cuba, known as Lukumi or Santaria. Um, when you're talking about spirits in the Haitian Vodou context, you use the term Loa. In the context of Congo, historically and today, when you're talking about back Congo peoples, you're using the term Simbi. Simbi still today maintains a legacy in the African diaspora. So in the same way that we can trace, for instance, Zikenga's legacy in Congo and the African diaspora, you see remnants of Simbi. And so the cosmogram that Dr. Martinez Ruiz inscribed in Haiti, there are songs to sing for the spirit Simbi. So in Haiti, the term Simbi has become associated with a particular spirit who is known in different manifestations. One is Simbi Dlo, Simbi of the fresh waters. But in addition, there's Simbi Makaya, who is the Simbi of the forest. Why is this the case? Because Basimbi spirits in Congo were known to reside in different residences. Some were freshwater spirits. Some were those that lived in the forest. And so these types of connections are so meaningful when done with the evidence. You know, young folks, y'all call it receipts, right? Having the receipts to be able to back up this research because it really demonstrates that these legacies continue even today. So thank you so much for that work. I'm sure I have some more questions, but I would love to save it for the audience. Um, are there questions that we have from the audience? We would love to hear from anybody who would like to contribute, especially students, but really anybody who would like to ask a question, make an inquiry. We welcome them. Wonderful. I'll bring the microphone to anybody who has a question or a comment. And if you could just please say your name, we would be most grateful. Hi, my name is Talia. I was just interested in the Shining Rock. You mentioned how it had so many groups of inscriptions. Are there any sites that um, you would say are like highly understudied with the breadth of knowledge they have? Or like, are there any troves that you've discovered in your time studying? Thank you. Um, I, I cannot, I cannot, uh, my colleague, uh, Chadrick uh, Shikuri, who is a professor of archaeology at Oxford, um, I was, this this site I found that the, the two days before I, I had to leave, I had to go back to Luanda and, and fly. Um, um, I, I think I went from Angola to Malawi. Um, and uh, someone told me that he, her, the uh, someone walking to the river saw these um, stones, the surface of the stone that have this drawing that looked like been made by a child. And um, and I I never take those kind of comments like uh, no, it, it's, it's it's not a child. I just I wanted to see it. And I have a, a very um, I rent that uh, I forget the an SOB. That didn't have any kind of power. It took a long time to get to that place. Finally, we get, and after that, I realized it's like 42 miles walking into the forest. I get there, and I, I see the drawings that didn't look like it being made by a child. But as I realized, the 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 stone didn't finish in the normal. You know, you can see, you can tell the edge of uh, the stone, no. And as I kind of cleaning, and the stone is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and turns to like 70. And I went to the next one, and it was another one, and another one. I said, it's like 11. And I kind of photographed, started photographing everything, and I sent it to to uh, my friend, Chadwick. And he said to me that this is the largest archaeological site, or the second largest archaeological site in African sub-Saharan, after the the, the great uh, uh, palace of a mambo in Zimbabwe, that he is the main you know, archaeologists in the wall. He's, he's very famous for that. And he, and he said, this, that, the one I work is the number one, according to everyone. And this, this one is the second most important. Um, that is kind of the story of the place. But I didn't have enough time. He sent me another message. I said, you have to go back and take a different type of photograph, the deposits on the surface, the dirt, and to see the shadow. And I was afraid to, because the trip was so difficult. I went back and I did all the photograph and I sent it back to to him. 
but what I realized I over since 1999 still I've been working in uh, rock painting I there is a strong connection with the language not in a kind of literal sense that you have a science and you have a proverb that that you know define each other nor there is interdependency between them and I, I realize it's something bigger than that that the actual structure of the language also is is the way you can use to explain the meaning on the site. And I think the first, the, the tree, and the first one with the, uh, the red ones and the one in the cave being explained by a system I created that I've been working for 20 years. I, I've been able last summer to really put in practice uh, the how they how they create a metaphor in Kikongo language, how they create meanings on that language. There's a specific logic in the language that you won't find in other language. And I kind of use the structure, the, the building blocks and the principle of the language and kind of apply to the way the symbol works, the relationship between the symbol. But I wasn't able to do that in the final one. Number one, because it's too big, was I only have a, a day and a half, you know, because the second day I just went just to take the photograph being asked. But also 5,000 uh, units, made out of nine symbols. I couldn't, I make a lot of drawing. I maybe have 2000, uh, um, I, I sketched down in a, in my iPad and I also did it in a piece of paper, but it's not enough. I think I need to go back in the summer. I, I need to buy a drums and kind of take a photo from the top and start kind of applying the, the model, the system I created to explain the other side that I know works. Um, and apply to this site, but it's the scales it will take it maybe, according to the archaeology department in Oxford, I think it will take uh, five years to to do, because I know to do like a, a house, protect the site. I need to buy out the the, the people who own that land. Um, they use for different agricultural things that I had to kind of assume the money that will made for the entire year kind of double, triple and ask them to to be the kind of the guardians of the place and help me out. And they already did. But I think that I need to find another clever way that I can involve them into the process of decoding this place and understanding the meaning of the place. There are two things about the site that um, are important in my series of questions and you know, talking to the, the people. There is a, a myth of a, an ancient uh, people that used to live in the in this place called them Fuluamenga. They kind of translate as a Mercury people, the people of fire. And according to the myth, the uh, these are the people that used to live before the Bakongo people arrived to this place. They used to be very tall, you know, seven feet high or something like that. And they used to have a different funerary tradition and so forth. Um, and they the the story. It's been, you know, passed to the people who own the places. The actual site was made by those people, not by by them. And the other stories that I heard, you know, passing through, um, is the 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 site that had to do with the the Congo Kingdom is all always based in this kind of internal uh, fight. The Portuguese appointed and they have. Uh, ideal king from a particular family they wanted to appoint it and the, uh, another noble family decide to kind of go into exiles and challenge the decision from the Portuguese. This area when the site is located is one of the stronghold for three different kings for in the 16th century, 17th century and 19th century that challenged with the uh, um, guerrilla warfare the Portuguese you know choices. That mean is many of the uh, symbols, I said pregnant women, since I'm a lot of pregnancy, a lot of animals, but also comets over time. And there are three different comets that have been depicted in, uh, you know, this is kind of glass in tr looking through now, now in my memories, all the symbols. Um, I, I, what I need to go back, and also the Capuchin monk also being killed in the same area. That is something else I wanted to, I'm being buried, and the body hasn't been found. In this area, there's something else I need to um, kind of unpack in relation to 
the size of the place because the narrative the 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 narrative is a little bit more complex than other places I encountered before because the, the it's a massive four hundred you know um, square meter that you know and I do this I have a team of, of people that I've been working with then since nineteen ninety nine. But you know, people died, other people go, and uh, it's very difficult to have this kind of continuity in the team. But the upside, the, I am the only upside person that is doing most of my PhD students. You know, said you know, Kira, they do other things, um, and I'm you know, I'm happy for that because it's a, if someone wants to study Islamic art, I just go to study Islamic art, learn the language. And for me, it's a good thing. No, I see that in in a, as a as a as a you know part of my development as a professor but i think i don't have all the external help i think uh, chadrick wanted to be a partner right now and come down with me he's from zimbabwe also he uh, um, there is a connection between that place and his own culture that kind of will help me besides to get all of the research for free then a, a dna test is 99 pounds it's a lot of money <laughs> And I have like, I don't know how many sample I have the bonds. I had to be test like uh, more than 60. It's a lot of money, but um, Oxford being generous right now, for now, but I need to find a, 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 someone. Um, I mean, you know, I have few, few uh, people that will help, friends, people I know that will help me, but I think I need more, something more systematic. This is what the National Geographic publication will be, you know, good for giving a lot of publicity and attention to something that people they don't know. So, thank you. Other questions, comments? Um, thank you for this incredible talk. I wish it was three hours long so you could go over each slide and explain more because I wanted to know so much more. Um, no, I was aware of the the time. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 the reason I kind of glanced through many, I just wanted to show you the example yeah. and show you, you know, the time I need to really use to explain what is, you know, entails in each of the example. Um, I'm, when I was, I, when I was, I was designing the, the lecture, I, I realized it's like 150 slides wow. that you didn't see it. Um, but you can tell on the end that I, 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 um, yeah, I, I think I plan to do this. There is a, uh, in May, the Imperial College in London asked me to do like three days, three lectures on only rock art, uh, for three days in a row that I think I will have the time to do. I think it's each one is one hour that I will have the time to do it. But the, I'm, so, I'm so sorry for, for that. No, I, I, so I, I have a few questions. One, the way you talk about writing and art and the way you kind of were going back and forth during the, between the two words really struck me. Um, the other part that I really wanted to know more about was when you were tracing the migratory route through what you were finding, were you finding a story that was building again like the way you showed us how you went from up to down and side to and around the tree for example did you find a narrative of migration as you followed um the forest and the different kind of the ways you said yes you yes 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 i think the the first time i think the 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 first thing that came to my mind was in a kind of my misunderstanding of um, a specific reference that, that someone was teaching me the the Congo people have a writings that use organic material. They use the forest as a template, no? And as they use, it's designed by hunters. When the hunter go seven days, like a writing also take place over seven days, no? When they go to the forest, they need to use, for example, different kind of flower. The color of the flower matters. Uh, different tree branches, cut you make in the trees until you, you know, you hunt something and you hide it, or you use salt to, you know, preserve it. And then in this conversation, this person was, you know, 
flame you literally in the forest that you get this beautiful flower for taking, you know, leaving the village, no? And then you, you signify out of a village have maybe 20 different paths, no? And if I wake up, I don't know, you know, Kira is a hunter. I don't know if she, leave, she left the, the village from this path, from other. I mean, this is so precise, you know, in the meanings associated with it. And he kind of insisted that you have to pay attention because he thought I wasn't paying attention. Until he said to me, you cannot walk in a straight line in the forest. And this one, uh, and I said, what do you mean? So I said, no, but in the forest, you just like, uh, you just, and he made this shape, you know, like a gesture, you know, like a spiral. And uh, and this is, you can see everything. The hunter always move around on to find the place, you know, eventually. Um, and then from that, I started kind of finding places because I I get into the river. I couldn't find anything in the other side of the river by the coastline, no evidence. And until someone told me that all the villages used to be in 1930s in the forest when the Portuguese built the road with the uh, Belgian authority, they forced all of the villages like from the interior of the forest to move to the road now to connect in Bansa Congo to Kinshasa. Um, and I'm asking where where your village come from. I said oh, I don't know how to explain it, but I know how to go. And I want to he, you know, we embark in this just walk, I don't know, like 10, 10 miles, and get to a place that was like a station for hunting, and uh, didn't have rock painting, didn't have anything. And I realized at this moment, not every site or every settlement was about rock painting. Didn't have. The places have it, places that didn't, but also have a different application. It to be a hunting station, or it to be the inheritance of the mother from the family they use for agricultural season, for and they only pass from the woman to the females in the lines. That is the the, and I realized each of the settlement they migrate, and they left a series of site that necessarily to be had to be rock painting site. And so I kind of try to tell the narrative of what that means when you move from one place to the next, you left a different type of site. They have a different meaning, but they are interconnected in the overall, you know, a meaning of the culture. And um, and the other thing is that each of the sites they have a particular name that is connected to the to the people who own the site. It's not the uh, an overall narrative of all of the Bakongo people moving to the east, that particular family moving through that particular path, that in, in, and somehow you kind of reverse the, you know, kind of reverse engineering and understanding how they understood their migration, you know, half into now who they are living into a Mazda Congo, like modern life, modern life, and so forth. Um, the, the first question about writing of art and arts are writing. This is something that being in our history um, is a very important uh, Western art do not question the idea of uh, writing could be a form of art. Um, we only question that when we think when we talk about all the type of art, they are not Western. Um, and I think is that is was what the way I try to kind of stress a little bit this assumption we have about writing as an art form rather than when we think about the uh, writing as a, something of utilitarian now is we think about writing as something that allow us to narrate our existence is repository our human experience is is you know we can use as a record in the archive but we cannot think about writing in the in the traditional sense when you think about Sassur, when the way he described writing is is, have a, is is social is can cannot be a writing cannot be defined between a human and a spirit or someone who died this is a limitation linguistic and semiotic have in itself but the the understanding of graphic writing system in the african context so i didn't use that word today that would be the actual proper name to describe graphic writing system the graphic writing system as a form of communication allow a human to communicate with someone who is no longer alive. That is a major difference, you know. But at the same time, allow to also to notate, you know, everyday life, you know, uh, experiences that we have 
in a traditional right and other alphabet in the way we think the alphabet is the quintessential example of how sophisticated and great we are. But the actual development of mode of communication in this particular part of the world, there is no specific preference about uh, giving um, a specific role to the alphabet as a main vehicle to communicate because you can communicate in a kind of holistic way by utilizing different type of notations as one. And it's what the idea of a system that you can use in, you know, iconography, uh, pictography, and then you can combine with the alphabet at the same time. What matters is the efficiency of the system and the familiarity with the system. Um, at least, for example, when I study, when, when I, 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 I don't know, I want to say the, the word force, but when I was uh, introduced to um, the Congo tradition as a kid, my mom, my grandmother came from Haiti, from a place called Verview, is in the north of Haiti, migrated to Cuba since she was uh, 18, and married my my grandfather, who was a Sephardi Jew. This is a very complicated life. Um, and they married in Cuba, two foreigners. Um, and the, at the age of three, you know, my grandmother asked me to, you know, well, ask my mom that had to be initiated. And I kind of started memorizing all the symbols, like 5,000 of them. But I couldn't understand. I, I knew the, the association with either of the designs or symbols, but I couldn't understand why. The process of making meaning that is, you know, is very important, it wasn't there. And that I think what I embark in my theory, in my study, is to try to understand why and how. And I realize it's something that took over centuries to really form as a, as a form of a graphic writing system and form of communication. That is pretty much what I, what I now I try to, what I, I'm, I'm pretty more close to understanding and explaining to someone who practiced that religion, you should not memorize the meaning of the signs and symbols. You should understand the, how the system works first, you know, and how you create meaning in the specific rule of that system, you know? rather than to try to memorize this. And, and, and one of the tests, you know, was one of the, the firmas have like a, like a recipe for a cleansing ceremony. And uh, my godfather did that and showed me and said, so you have to go and get it. And I read it and I couldn't understand why. And I get, I get most of them, I miss, you know, a third of the, and and when I give it one to him and say, no, this is not the first one. But I said, the order was also explained in the actual design. And I, and I realized it was more about the instruction to get something was about the entire procedure was also explained to how you understand each of the material, how they come together through time and performing the actual cleansing ceremony. No one really explained that. You kind of learn, you know, uh, by making mistakes. I, I don't want to learn by making mistakes. That is also important in learning. But also I wanted to, the people understand the logic of that system, the mindset uh, that have, you know, a particular way of, you think about the presentation of the boats. Or the idea of uh, you ask uh, in, in Congo term to make a straight line, the people, the person will make a circle that doesn't touch on the end. That is a straight line. Physically, and you know, the graphic depiction of a straight line is completely opposite to the way we think about a straight line, no? Because in there is is that circle that never come together, it's never complete in a way, or, you know, something like the war for what represents a boat is about water, is about transitions, is about migrating from place to place. You know, each of these, the word is, is also is a notational language that each of the uh, intonations and accents kind of change the actual meanings of uh, uh, the word. And this is what I, I rely on. Is the understanding the logic of a language is very important in understanding the logic of the meanings and what they wanted to convey in through the site by engaging the people into, you know, I have like 20 people at this one given time reading the symbol with me. And um, and we just go back and forth writing down and we make the drawings on the back. 
is always go back into, you know, how they use the language, what they mean these particular words. And they have precise and sometimes more elusive. And this particular moment, the example of I bring it to them, how you make it precise, that you can you can understand how elusive could be those association at a particular moment in time or through a particular kind of representation. I don't know if I answered the questions. Well, you started answering the question that I had, which is like, how, could you talk a little bit more about the process of translating? But, because uh, when when I think about your lecture, like, thank you so much, like, very inspiring. Uh, when I think about it, you you first started with the cosmogram, which is telling us the logic, right, of the system. Yeah. And then you went into individual stories. And I was really fascinated with the individual histories and narratives that you're translating so yeah if you could speak a little bit more about the process you just mentioned like right 20 people around like decoding the different how do you go from the cosmogram the logic of the system into using that logic to translate the individual narratives that you found in the different places uh, i think i'm, I'm the, maybe the best way is to explain what happened this summer the last summer i i i have this the 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 um, red. I'm sorry. The red. The one with the red. that have the person with the arm. And uh, we went. You know, we went to the village. And uh, when we get to the village, the you know, this is a very complicated process. Like you had to be very patient and with people. Also, you need to strike like a balance between respect and fear, no? That, you know, the people that have an association in Mbansa Congo, in that area, what they call is the light inside the devil. That is my nickname. Um, that tell you a lot of how they see me. Um, um, and in a way, you know, I, in, you have to combine to be generous and gentle, but at the same time, you need to also throw your line to a certain thing you don't want to do and you wanted to do. And so um, we went to the village, to that village, and the, the village head and the head of the family said to me, we have this side, but we, we, have, we don't know anything about this side. And I, I begin with, say, how you name it. And... Um, like called Tali the Mpungi is the 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 limited rock or sign, something like that. Something that and I said, how you use it? I say, ah, oh, the our land ends with that rock. It's like kind of the limit of our physical land that go to two rivers to in that direction. And you see this mountain on the top. Also, this is a not the top of a mountain, right at the edge of a mountain. And that I said, well, who did that? And the, the, he said, oh, the people who own this land, we migrate here around 300 years ago. You know, it's kind of, it's, you have to, you know, it's not precise, but, but, we, they, but what, what that means is they recognize the people in that village. And now they are integrated into, they are Makongo. But they consider as people, they came from all the part of the kingdom. 300 years ago. No, they are immigrants in somehow. And the people who designed this allow them to be in that particular location of the village and give them that land. And the painting was made to signify the limit between them, you know, a generous act being, you know, professed by the owner of the land. And they kind of made that painting to signify that transaction. Uh, and they said, but by the way, on top of this mountain, there is a village in which those people used to live. That can complicate the whole thing. A village? <laughs> I need to see it. Um, I'm workaholic and, you know, I everything I wanted to do. Um, and um, I said, but how you call this now? Tell the Mpungi, the limit, you know. But I say Mpungi is now the limit. Mpungi is like a trumpet. What is the connection between calling something a trumpet as musical instruments and the limit? You know, even in the language, there, there are specific connotations. I said, oh, 
and they kind of tried to elaborate, but they couldn't elaborate until I said, okay, I wanted to talk to the elders, all of the elders from the, like the people over 80. Um, I will come back tomorrow. Um, and when we have a conversation, and this is how unfold, you know, I came bring back the people from the village and we, they went through a series of proverbs attached to each of the symbols, you know? And I kind of was writing down you know, recording at the same time, making drawings. And I said, let's do something. Well, we don't go all together to the to the side. But I cannot ask the people that are 80 years old. I said, ah, okay, yeah, no, we, we can get before you to the place. They did before me. <laughs> we They get there. And you know, I spent like 20 people looking at the sign for the first time, no? And when you just, the first one was that the one with the uh, open arms, it's like a, a human, and they have a series of, I think seven, if I remember right, seven uh, units kind of around. So in turn how the hands look like it's reaching there. And I say, what is what is that? What, who, who is this person? What is represent? And some person, some person say, oh, this is a Simbi. They say, well, Simbi, Simbi Kiamuntu, Simbi of the person or Simbi Makaya, because there are three here, Simbi Kiamongo, the, the mountain, which one? And say, no, this is uh, Zambian Pungu, God. Okay, which one, which God, the physical one or the spiritual one? The one is tangible, the one is visible. Oh, Barbara, you are too complicated. You know, I, I just want to know. I want to, and um, I said, let's do something. Before we get into the ring, why we don't do the normal procedure of you know looking at because I don't I don't want something bad happen. I wanted to follow protocol. And the the two of the elders, you know, eighty something, they get you know I, I have all of the ingredients for the for the ceremony that I had to do all the time. When what I hear when they the opening you know libation, they ask. The drawing, this has never happened before. They asked the drawing if the drawing wanted me to look at them. No? And I said, this never happened before. That changed my entire research forever. That in somehow the drawing have an agency and is alive that need to authorize me first than me to look at the drawing. But whatever I was looking before, I wasn't able to understand without the permission authorization. And the first ceremony was about asking the drawing and uh, give me the right to look at them. And later, the mountain in which the also to allow me to be there and nothing happened, an accident, because the, the actual the actual drawing is a kind of hide like like over the, the over the ceiling, no? You have to climb up, and it's like a tiny balcony, so you can fall off and and die. And it's you know twenty people in the tiny, you know, I try to take a photograph. It's impossible. I use my phone, and it's all of them. They kind of asked everyone to go down, and and I was underneath listening, you know, recording the whole thing. That come start with that. In a way, that kind of changed my entire research from before that I was kind of trying to understand the, the language, understand the meaning, but I couldn't even start from the most important thing, basic thing, that the drawing need to talk to me first and give me the authorization before I read it. That raised an interesting question about why and how we read and who has a right over literacy. In this case, it's given the, that pos you know, positioning, the condition of you know, reading and writing and learning and cognition come from the drawing in itself that in a way is about the culture, no? That is pretty much what I say. Um, and that is just one particular example. The other one in the cave, I, I walk inside the cave and um, I couldn't see the drawing. And the, the person say, after we did this, so we did similar ceremony and everything else, you know, authorized me to look at the, and I, and I said, look at, look at the wall. I couldn't see it. I said, get closer. Turn on your light 
I want to underline the drawing reappear like magic. Like you can walk inside the cave 200 times, you never will be able to see it until he pointed out into. But when he, I saw the the the, the, the drawings on the wall, and the panel on the left, they have three hands, stain cells, prints on the red. Everything is black, no? And I asked the same question, do you know what that means? I said, oh, my people during, um, you know, 300 years ago, when they attacked from the Yaka, we used to take refugee in this cave. And a lot of people die. And then there is another, there was a gallery next to that have uh, 200 human remains inside, over 200. I kind of, he showed me when it's like a, like a vast, you know, you know, space with bonds, uh, women's, men's, kids, and a lot of terracotta thing. And then somehow but people never, you know, they took refugee in the cave and never left. And then somehow this was, and I need to have authorization from them to give me a um, fragment from the terracotta and the bones to send it to the lab because I wanted to know exactly where um, this particular event took place. And I went back to the drawings and the drawing, I asked, do you know what that mean each of them? And he said, I have an, each of them have a particular name. And so oh, this is that, this is that, this is that. But he couldn't really explain me how to read it. But when he explained me how to use the layout of the cave, that kind of matched the actual layout that was uh, depicted on the, and I kind of went back and I said, I use the premises of the language to try to understand the each of the proverb. We went back to the proverb, exactly what that means. All of different interpretation, four, five. I mean, I have in my, in my team, there is a Capuchin monk, for example. Uh, there is a, a, someone from the um, um, the Anglican church, no? The, also, it's very important the the Baptist church also is in Mbasa Congo. The was the first the first one is uh, also there. The Kibokolo, one of the priests from uh, is also is in my team. Um, um, a Catholic nun. This is a given. You know, a, someone in the seventies and someone who's twenty two. Each of them have a different uh, level of profici um, proficiency in the language. No, and sometimes when you translate something, the proverbs say, you say, "Oh, this means that." They kind of in the literal way. Until the person who is seventy-two says, "Ah, oh, you do not understand Kikongo," and they have, a, and they have this fight because no, this is not what that means. Mean this and this and that, and you can see the more complexity, a nuance in the way you can use the language. And I realize each, and I ask a specific why you arrived to that conclusion back in when you used to be in your 20, 50, 70 years ago versus someone else, because there's people now looking, you know, they speak Lingala right now, they don't, you know, learn proper Kikongo and they're losing the, you know, the specificity of the language. Um, and I think that is kind of my experience with uh, most of the people I I work, you know, I um, I know I know them for, for the last 20 years from the, my headquarters is in the Capuchin mission that I convinced the Capuchin to give me a, uh, a chapel inside the mission. They take all of the crosses and everything, all of the, and I use that as my headquarter um, to do my research. And I know then the, the Danilo, who is from Venice, I met him in 1999 and he saved my life. Um, there's people I know for a long time ago, even also they know what I do, what I study, I, you know, I practice this religion, I'm not Catholic. It doesn't mean I am not, but, you know, I could be Catholic, I am somehow. Um, but I think they they embrace all this complexity uh, in the place. What I try to say is that every place I go, I, I don't drive to places I walk. The people see me, even if I have a car, you know, I, I walk like a five mile, in the morning every day and the people think i'm crazy why he comes to angola he have a car and he walk five miles or run the miles um every day he's he's crazy but that is you know i try to bring that kind of level of familiarity with them and trust 
by showing who I am. Both ways, I, I can show that I could be also dangerous and then very dangerous person if I want to. And I can prove it to them. And that is what the myth on all of the, um, I think it was an incident, the governor called me to the house and he 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 died. And later he turned to my friend, a friend of mine before he went into the hotel and confiscated all my thing. And um, the police took me to the police station um, and they accused me to be a diamond trafficker. The governor and the army. So in Angola, you don't have those kind of, you don't have freedom. And I was in, and I asked to the, uh, the uh, prison uh, to, to talk to the governor. You had to bring me here. And I have a letter for the governor from one of his lovers. Um, and he came to see me. I give him the, the letter from his lover. And he read it. I said, I'm sorry for the misunderstanding. Um, you go back to the hotel. Um, I started doing my research, and you had to come to see me uh, um, next week to have a, this proper, you know, I need to announce to everyone you are doing research here. And then next week I went, I went with people from my team, and I get to the, the guard, I have a, a K-47 in his hands, and he said, oh, you know, you're dressing like a piece of shit. You should not, you know, in order to talk to the governor, you have to get, you know, a jacket, a proper, this is not the way you have, you do respect, you know, you are very disrespectful. Um, and he was about to hit me with the, and I, I took her, the AK for, from his hands and I kind of point him and the, the governor was looking at me and all the, my my team was behind me. And that was the kind of moment that the guys get nervous. The governor came down. Barbara, you know, don't do. I, I wasn't about to do anything. I just wanted to show, you know, I know about weapons. I know how to use it. Don't, you know, don't be rude to me and don't, you know, point me with something. If you don't want to use it, don't do that to me. That was kind of rule I have. And the, from that day, the people start saying, "Oh, this guy is crazy." I'm not gonna say. I, I, I didn't want to correct it because that gave me a little bit. <laughs> Anyway, and, uh, but that all the story, but that that I think that kind of balance is very important. Uh, that you know this kind of person, you can just you know push around. Um, you, you know you need to. They need to respect me, not because I am a foreigner or have resources, because I am Barbara. You know I am a human being, and you need, they need to understand that. And I need to find a way to let them know my humanity. That that they have to come with that respect of my space, uh, who I, what I do, my integrity, and so forth. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think we might have time for maybe one more question, if anybody wants to pose another query or even share a comment. I have to say, not that I want to put anybody, you know, on the spot, but I've been hearing uh, some affirmations from the Amen Aibubu Ashe corner over here. <laughs> Is there anything you might like to share? <laughs> oh, what Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I think we had a really wonderful representation of some different fields, some different disciplines here. Um, and I, I want to maybe ask just this closing question, which is about accessibility of our research. You mentioned about how difficult it can be to do this type of work in terms of cultivating trust, building relationships that are not just transactional, but that are meaningful relationships. And I especially appreciate your mention of, you know, realizing there's, there's, you know, I think good research includes an aha moment when you say, I've been thinking about all of this wrong, you know, and I can think about conducting research in Congo, specifically in Kikwit, and looking for Minkisi, looking for these sacred vessels. And I'm looking for statues. I'm looking for Minkisi in Kondi. I'm looking for these particular types of Minkisi that I've been taught. And it's 
as I'm there that I'm realizing, oh, Minkisi can take so many forms. Maybe these humble pots are the Minkisi I've been looking for, you know? So I really appreciate this importance of, of recognizing our own humility on our research journeys. So the question I have is about accessibility. Uh, when the work that we do is hard, when it's hard to travel to these places, when it requires the learning of multiple languages, I mean, you all should know that Dr. Martinez Ruiz speaks maybe six, seven languages or so. When, when these depths of knowledge can be difficult to gain access to, how do we make it accessible to wider audiences? You mentioned, for instance, a partnership with National Geographic. Um, so curious to know about how do we, how do we spread the words of these types of deep wisdom? I, I think it's the, one of the problem is the publication system is highly centralized. Um, and there is not, I think when you get trapped into this promotion um, system, uh, you have to produce a certain amount of body of work to be promoted from A, B, and C. Um, I, I'm not undermining the importance of being promoted and being rewarded for what you do, but sometimes we lost a lot of our humanity in that process and also create a lot of stress and anxiety. On top of that, you know, the publications in uh, academic, you know, the rule for tenure hasn't really changed. The publications uh, for tenures, they are, you know, down more than 50%, you know. Most university close their arts divisions or they are, you know, now Yale, MIT. There's only this is now you know between two universities publishing arts, and there's a similar version of that in other. Stanford didn't have an arts, you know, division anymore. Stanford University Press, you know, you have a decrease in attention the uh, departments in the university press uh, for the art, and less for. Um, Publishing this kind of material, the African African content, no, you might have uh, Temple, uh, um, Washington University, uh, Duke. You know there are a few universities that are kind of specialized, and and they kind of monopolize the systems in a way, but they overprice the books. You know my books on Amazon is like two thousand seven hundred forty dollar. Who can buy this? Nobody. Um, this is kind of problems that. Academia hasn't really solved, no. And also, um, most of the, the requirements that hasn't really changed. In a way, this is like we are completely on denials of the problems, or maybe it can be used as a tool to get less people paying years and so forth. You want to be cynical about it. But for me, I think is uh, the making accessible the work. Start with something as simple as what Robert Farris Thompson did in his early work. Uh, he shared his research with other people, with the people he did the research. Everything he wrote, he went back to Cuba, Haiti, Congo, Nigeria, and he shared that with them. And allow to the local subject, in a way, to be aware they've been taking care in, in, a, in, a, in this in particular way. That wasn't kind of anti promises from this scholar that came all the way from New Haven, went to the Congo and did this research and disappear. He went back and read it back there. And I think that for me is a very important something I do. All of the things I wrote, I write, I I I go back and share. I do not publish until I get the authorization from them. That is very important to me. That is something Thompson, a legacy that Thompson. You know, I inherit and you inherit from me, no? Um, that is the first one. The second one is to identify a different um, venues without losing the rigor of the editorial, you know, peer reviews that they are more in tune with uh, uh, the commitments we have and the need to understand those kind of subject matter need a special attention. No. And for example, the I was mentioned to you before the diasporic press. Um that you know they decide to publish only African author. No. 
classics of the you know African intellectual and so forth. And I asked the the director of the press, who also is a a professor. He's a gifted, you know, he's a famous historian. He's not a random person. I say how how we can do a type of publication that we can have a little bit more of uh, rigor than the normal tradition, just to avoid any kind of you know someone to scrutinize and 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 make those kind of comments. And allow the, the the person who are contributing, the people, the author contributing scholar in the process to understand that we creating this new approach, uh, this new peer review system that would be, you know, uh, we had to explain in a very comprehensive way, but also allow not just to focus in physical books, so we can do um, ebooks, you no, know? um, also we can a blogs in which you can um, have a version of the book in which you, you can design in your own way and something that will be accessible to uh, social media to to people I think and then we can use a multiple layer in which the same knowledge is kind of crafted in a different way one go for free from the blog until the book there had to be a price that would be accessible to people and um and the rest, you know, and you invite the people that, that you think there are important voices in the field. And I think those kind of new alternatives that they are emerging right now. But as I say, it's very easy to say when you have other people in the field. And African art is a very small field. You know, it's like three, four people have a, a absolute control over the field, you know, decisions for fellowship and promotions and also being asked for tenure promotion, they just can write a, a funny sentence that the people get nervous in the department and say, oh, this is a bad comments and derail the life of a person. And many, you know, famous scholar of African art have a spirit of that kind, very important people. Um, that means is that um, that system is not working. That system is not working. Um, but the other the other problems that is affecting the visibility is African art is concealed in the discipline of our history. You know? And in the department of our history, that in general have a, a zero understanding of African art history. That is a, dis, a, a field that always been in conversation with archaeology, anthropology from day one, you know. Um, the traditional art history is discovering anthropology now, you know, in maybe the last five, ten years. Uh, but the most of the, you know, in the department, they do not understand. And what happened in, for example, you look into the jobs in the last five years, only two jobs only are on African art. All the jobs say African American art, Afro Caribbean. African diaspora and Latin American art. I mean, you will have even one person African art is impossible. But now you will have four independent fields that you to have a particular designated professor 10, 20 years ago. Now they've been merged in one, and there will be one person that teach all of the different fields as one. My department, they don't want to talk to them about it. They think it's normal. Ah, you know, you do Africa, you can do the African, it's the same. And save money. I, mean, I understand the economic incentive of having those kind of, um, you know, lack of you know clarity. Why you should have a professor or multiple professor? You know, we have multiple professors in my department that teach the same subject. You know, Renaissance. That is not a problem in my department. They they don't have a problem with that. And and even I can tell you, they only study one artist from the Renaissance. And it's not fair, but that is the way it works. Number one, we need to change the structure of the department and the awareness of uh, the discipline of our history a little bit more complex than the traditional subdivisions of, you know, area studies that, that used to work. And number one, and number two, uh, there should not be one person covering everything Africa in the world. That doesn't make sense. And also it prevent even 
the, that professor to really clarify the meaning of Africa to the student at the end of the day, jeopardize the actual missions as explain the specificity, how Africa had to be defined in different contexts and in different historical places. Because you had to do a survey from 35,000 years ago of rock painting into contemporary art in, in one semester in 14 weeks. That is impossible. With the continent have more diversity of language and people, no? And timeline. And one semester is is like it's like a joke. It's ridiculous. And they don't have a problem with that. My colleagues do not have a problem with that. And I think going back to the question of visibility, how how you can have visibility when the structure of the system doesn't prevent you to fully practice in your own external of your skills of speciality. And I think all of the changes need to happen at the same time. New venues need to, um, for example, when I asked the Temple University Press of my first book, why the book on Amazon is 2000, whatever. And they said, oh, they get it from us. And they're overpricing the whole thing. But what are you doing about it? Oh, we cannot control Amazon. But you already overpriced the book, $76 is already overpriced. And that is why you had that problem in the first place. It was something simple that the best interest of the press is to allow the people to read your work, no? And there's something that can be, you know, a change that can take happen in the in the actual, you know, press is completely ignored. I asked them to closed um, my contract because they breached three of the four you know, agreements. Um, and I will, will be reprinted right now by CUNY. That is the, um, and I think I added another chapter, another chapter and so forth. And I will be at $24, you know, that would be the price. They agree even a color and all those kind of things. I renegotiate the whole thing, not because, you know, Temple wanna, it's because they didn't care. Um, and that for me is a problem. Is, uh, but I think that finding new venues to show your scholarship, I think is important. Um, even from, you know, open sources like National Geographic and all those kind of thing, or finding, you know, a different platform in, uh, you know, this is a, for example, the Heritage Magazine from Oxford and Rutgers University is online. They don't do actual physical book, but the most important archeologists in the world you know, publish with them. I mean, and they have a massive, you know, following. I mean, the, our work had to get into those kind of venues because they are important. Um, yeah. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Martinez Ruiz one more time. Thank you all so much for joining us. Special thanks again, of course, to the Institute of African Studies, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for holding this.